everyone, welcome to Cleveland Family Church. It's so great to see so many of you in the building. And uh, welcome to anyone tuning in at home. It's, uh, it's such a blessing to be able to praise God um, this morning together, uh, wherever we are, because of what Jesus has done for us. We can have that relationship with him, wherever we are, whatever we're going through. Um, it's such a great thing. Uh, so this morning we'd love to, to open the word with, with one another, um, to, to learn more about who God is and what he's done for us and, and how we should be living our lives and, and have a time of praise together. Um, Rebecca's just going to open the service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of being here this morning and the fact that we can just do church together as your people, Heavenly Father. And so I just pray that you would move amongst us that uh, you would just accept our praise and our worship as our offering of thanksgiving and gratitude. We just want to honour you this morning, and I just pray for every person that's here and every person viewing at home that this might be a special encounter of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that uh, whatever anybody might be going through, whatever has gone before and whatever is ahead, Heavenly Father, that we will have a special sense of knowing your love, your care, your direction, your guidance, your patience with us, and uh, the fact, Lord, just that you are so in all of our tomorrows, no matter what that might be. And so, Lord, be with us, we pray now in Jesus' name. And just bless Richard as he brings us the word. May it be really so refreshing to us and uh, that we will go from here into the week ahead, uh, anointed by your Holy Spirit. So we just commit this time to you now in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together and praise God. <laughs>
you have your Bibles with you, um, we're reading from Psalm, Psalm chapter 51, verses 10 to 17. Psalm 51, 10 to 17. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. We'll stand again and, and sing another couple of songs before Richard comes. Bear with me.
Good morning, everybody. Very nice to see you. It's funny, when I, when I get ready to speak and I have to go through my routine of the face mask, glasses, microphone, it reminds me of a Gary Larson cartoon where a farmer's wife has left early and uh, she's left some instructions uh, by the bed and there's a big poster saying, pants first, then trousers. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pick up on um, my series, it's just looking at characteristics of a believer. And I'm just going to read a few verses to you from 1 John 2, verses 12 to 14, where John says, I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. So we've been looking at the characteristics of what would, we would say would be a true believer. And John helpfully spells out some of these characteristics in his letter to the early church. And the first subject we looked at was the matter of obedience. And we looked at how obedience to God isn't life in a straitjacket. It's quite the opposite. It's actually a path to a real life of freedom because there is an eternal and divine plan for each one of us. And until we have exposure and knowledge or or awareness of that, we're the ones who are in the straitjacket. We're the ones who are missing out. Obedience is a good thing. It saved my children's life, being obedient. I remember one time we were walking along the road and somebody else's child ran and they almost uh, ran into the street and got run over. And uh, I think Hamish was going to do the same. I said, stop. And he stopped immediately. Obedience saved his life. There is an eternal divine plan and a purpose for you and it is a life of freedom it is not a straitjacket then we looked at love and the bible tells us that god is love his essence is love and he loves us with a perfect love love that is central to his very character and when we experience the love of god in our lives we love god back don't we maybe not perfectly certainly not perfectly But we also considered then when we have the love of God within our lives and we love God, it actually enables us to love others, even our enemies. And we can choke on that, can't we? Can we? (laughs) Yeah, it's, but it's true. Over time, we can love even our enemies as the love of God fills our lives. As we love God, as we should, so can we love others. And next up is this matter of spiritual growth. That's what I want to talk about this morning, and our reading mentions children. It mentions mature people, and it mentions young people. Now, in the original Greek, John, uh, John refers to male characters in this particular reading. Um, so he uses the phrases children, young men, and fathers. But the reality is he was definitely addressing male and female. He was just writing in the style of the day. So I've read from the NLT version just because it conveys what it means to us in the modern English. It means all of us. And his references to children, mature people, and young people relate to the spiritual state of a believer. You have young believers, new believers. You have uh, wise and mature aged believers, and you have people in between. And believe it or not, you get childish believers. You might have uh, bumped into some childish believers. You might be a childish believer. But there are wise and seasoned believers. And as I said, you get the in-between. And John's turn of phrase here, because it sounds like I repeated the same thing twice. He repeats several times how he has written to this group of people. And then he goes on to say how he is writing to this group of people. And it's really just conveying the idea that This is a life of progress, growth. He's written to them before. He's writing to them again. He's reinforcing a point they knew, and he wants them to remember. 
the need to progress. Being a true believer isn't a tick box exercise where you might say, well, I've, I've bought the t-shirt. I've been there, seen it, done it. No, it's a life of progression. And if your life is anything like mine, that might mean that it's not necessarily plain sailing. But it is progression, albeit sometimes we do regress. And whatever our stage of progression, John reminds us all that our sins are forgiven. That as believers, we know God. And over time, we get to know him more. And over time, we get the opportunity to show our faithfulness to God. And over time, we win battles over evil. And over time, the word of God becomes embedded in our minds. And we are progressively less like our former selves. Not that we are not ourselves, we just become changed. More in the image of God, in his likeness, we become what the Bible says is Christ-like. And of course, our example is Jesus, of which the Gospels record that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. The perfect man. We see in Jesus how rounded we are and can become godly wisdom, physically strong, a right relationship with God and a right relationship with people. And God knows there are limitations in this life. So when we look at Jesus, I, I understand, we all understand that there are limitations within us. Perhaps our minds are deteriorating as we get older. I, I can feel it every morning, the day after I get up for a run, my, my hip, it's my left hip and my knees, I feel, they're beginning to get a bit clunky. But we may have other physical limitations or, or disadvantages. But whatever our lot in life, we can all take encouragement from the words of Paul, where he says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I do know that my physical limitations will be dealt with when I have my resurrection body. But in between now and then, Jesus is the perfect man, and we look to him as our example. And so as an indicator of our genuine claim to be a believer, I'm saying, or well, John is telling us, that growth is an indicator. Life has changed, hasn't it? Well, has it? Has it changed? Can we remember what life was like? before we first trusted Christ? Has our behavior, our attitudes, our priorities changed at all since then? Do we have a, a better understanding of God and his ways and his word? Do we have a closer relationship with God? Have we progressed on that journey towards what John is referring to as spiritual maturity? Reminding ourselves of sins forgiven helps us grow. John says, I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. And no matter what progress we've made as believers, no matter how strong or weak we are, this message applies to the whole church, to every believer. It is fundamental to our belief, albeit John does emphasize this point to the ones he calls little children new believers. Forgiveness of sins is central to the Christian faith. You cannot find it anywhere else other than through trusting Christ. Most basic, it's the most basic truth a believer will ever know about your sins being forgiven. Not very many words, but can we ever depth the real significance of that promise of God that he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from our unrighteousness. I don't know. I think not, not in this life. It's too much to comprehend. I get it, but I don't understand the enormity, the cost, the price. But the more I look, the more amazing it is that God loves us, he forgives us, and he has dealt with our sin, and some struggle to accept that God can love and forgive them. And they even forget, uh, struggle to forgive 
themselves. And this can be especially true for new believers, for whom perhaps some of their recent history might still be fresh. And some people do beat themselves up about their history. And they're not fully appreciating the enormity of what God has done. Your sins are forgiven. We are no longer guilty of our sins. We don't carry that guilt. We are no longer to be judged for those sins. We are no no longer living under condemnation for those sins. And we will not receive punishment for those sins. He really does clean the slate. He sets us free. And Isaiah foretold how the Messiah would come and deal with this sin problem. He says, it was our weaknesses he carried. He's referring to Jesus. He's looking ahead to the cross. Our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped, so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Our sins are dealt with once and for all. Now, isn't that enough reason or encouragement or excitement or incitement to actually progress our relationship with a loving and forgiving God, to grow in our faith and relationship with him, does that not draw us to want to know? Why does God forgive us? Because we deserve it? No, we don't deserve it. And looking at the New King James Version of this verse, um, in the Older English, I I prefer it. it. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for his name's sake. God forgives us far more for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, than for our sake. He looks to him and and what he did. And Jesus Christ, the perfect man, he lived a perfect life. He loves the Father with a perfect love, and, and we see what he did. And for the sake of him, God forgives us. In Philippians, we read, of Jesus, though he was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. So he he left heaven. Instead, it says, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's where our sin went. That's what happened to our sin. It was laid on him. And to those that will put their trust in that act, that act of love and sacrifice, God lays his righteousness over us. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin." For us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And God recognizes this act of transfer and accepts us out of recognition for what Jesus did. All we have to do is accept it, accept forgiveness, and He gives it freely. Your sins are forgiven you. For his name's sake. Or you could say, our sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. And God honors anyone who honors his son and what he did. This truth alone should act as a guard against us going backwards, returning to a lifestyle of sin. The life perhaps that we led before we came to faith. But we're especially vulnerable, I think, when we're young in the faith, because the old lifestyle can be pretty fresh. 
And that's why growth is needed. We need to progress and become mature Christians. And it is a sad fact that, that some don't really get going very far. And it's true, perhaps, of, of all of us that sometimes we might go backwards. But John is telling us that we need to grow. We need to mature. If, we, if receiving forgiveness is the starting point for all of us, then we need to take a more mature approach to our faith. A more, approach, more mature approach to God's word. Is it on the shelf or is it open? Setting time aside to pray. Fellowshipping with God and fellow believers. Sharing our faith with others, contributing to the work of the church, helping on a practical level, using the gifts that were given for God's glory. But always at the core is this sense of gratitude and love and thanks to God that the whole starting point was forgiveness of sins at that point when we first came to faith. And the joy of that should never leave us and it should motivate us, shouldn't it, to get close and to serve God. It's a lifelong thing. Paul likened it to a long-distance race. He wrote, he wrote to Timothy. Timothy was a young man. Paul knew that his days were numbered. And he wrote to him and said, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Wow. Study the life of Paul. <laughs> That's how far you can go as a mature believer. And some believers, of course, are in between those two stages, the, the mature and the child you're not a child anymore, but you might not be a mature adult in your faith. You've come a long way, but there's a long way to go. And John says, I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. What's John referring to? Personal victories. Personal victories are available to all who set off on this journey of faith in God. Your personal life will change if you grow. Perhaps common sins that were perhaps prevalent once upon a time, seemingly unable to control, are progressively overcome. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and when his light shines in our lives, we see areas that have got to change. That's actually growth. That's progress. It's good. But how do we overcome sin, the world, and Satan? Draw near to God. Ask for wisdom. James writes, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. How about using God's word as a weapon? A weapon to conquer temptation. Jesus did. Do you remember when Satan was tempting him? What did he say to him? No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Jesus quoted scripture back to Satan. What about endurance? I don't like the sound of endurance because that perhaps means I have to get out of my comfort zone. It might mean I, I might suffer. But again, James picks this up. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Well, I know what my natural tendency is. I, cons I consider my troubles to be an opportunity for great despair and disappointment and anger and being cross. Do you ever get that? We miss out on the opportunity if we don't consider these experiences in life as an As a Christian, as a believer, you put your head above the parapet and there are people wanting to 
take pot shots. It's an opportunity to grow. And it's even an opportunity for joy. And we mustn't give in to the old nature. Paul says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. This is telling us here that you can resist. You don't have to default to sin. You have choices. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. This is how to grow. How about equipping ourselves with the armor of God? We're told to do that. In Ephesians, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Do you want to resist? We're told how to do it. And we're told what the outcome is. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. What a great place to be. We're also to be on our guard. In Peter we read, I'm warning you ahead of time, dear friends, be on guard so that you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Compromise is really easy, isn't it? It's quite easy to leave a chink of light or a chink of darkness <laughs> would be a better way of looking at it. Don't even give a chink, an opening to the enemy. Paul writes, let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Just one example. Anger can be a chink of darkness. Don't give opportunity. James says, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's an amazing promise, isn't it? I used to think that he was the problem. He's not the problem. I'm my problem. <laughs> I'm my biggest problem. Resist the devil and he will flee. Flee temptation. That's because I'm the problem. I have the weakness. That's why in Proverbs we read of the need to be careful about the company we keep and the places we go. We read, don't do as the wicked do. And don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn and keep moving. I'm sure we all know what it's like to, to, to want to look over our shoulder as we reluctantly perhaps go away from a situation that looked quite nice. And we know it's wrong. Turn away and keep moving. This is not describing a passive life, is it? This cannot possibly be a Sunday Christian kind of life. This is a way of life. And you want to grow in your faith. These are the kinds of things we have to do. Forgiveness may have been the starting point, but it also leads to relationship. The reasons for doing this and the benefits are getting close to God, developing a living and loving relationship with God, our Father. And John says, I've written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. From that point of repentance and decision to follow Christ, we have a lifetime to develop a relationship with God. And no matter what stage we're at in our Christian walk today, we must never forget who we know. We know God. This is huge. We know him. And this is the greatest known privilege in life, is to know God personally. And not only that, to be adopted as his child. And that is your status. When you put your trust in him, he adopts you into his family. In Romans we read, his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. 
In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. What a privilege, isn't it, to call God our Father, the the supreme being who made everything, the all-powerful God who sustains everything and gives life. And we know him as a person. He's relatable, he's loving, and he's kind. And he wants to be the father of all, including you, if you're not already. He wants you to bring your needs to him. He wants us all to trust and depend on him for the future. He wants us all to learn about what he's got in store. He even wants to put things right when they go wrong. He wants a daily, ongoing, real relationship as a perfect father to a child. And at the the core, his motivation is love. And he wants us to grow in that love. And if that's our experience, he'd like you to tell some other people about it as well. (laughs) Why wouldn't you tell someone? Why don't we? God knows the strength we need to do that as we grow. And he gives it. You don't need to fear it. In Colossians we read, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. You won't be lacking. If you need God's power, he'll give it. If you want to share your your faith with others and you're, you're worried, Don't worry. He's got glorious power. God gives us the wisdom wisdom and direction we need to live by his word. Paul again writes to Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. There's a phrase I really detest at the moment, and it's called my truth. (laughs) Whether it's an Olympic cyclist and a winner of all of the tours, who took drugs and gives his story and calls it my truth or whatever, there is only one truth. There is God's truth. And we have access to that truth. We have access to the speaker of that truth, the originator of truth, the truth. That's why we defer to him. Sometimes we have to take a reality check just to finish. And we have to consider whether we might be going backwards, perhaps. Maybe we might be even stuck in neutral. Maybe our priorities haven't been what they should be. I was thinking this morning, maybe today is the time we need to address that. Maybe we've been coasting. Maybe we've been neglectful. Maybe when it comes to matters of the word, God's truth, fellowship, prayer, thanks, and being willing, perhaps, to be exposed to instances where it it might be difficult. Maybe we've ducked it. Maybe we've perhaps denied by not doing something. In Lamentations, we read, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. This is good news. If if you're feeling that you might have fallen short, I do. I fall short. But the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. Then the best part for me, his mercies begin afresh each morning. So today, as you've come into church or tuned, tuned in on, uh, on your computer or phone or whatever, his mercies begin afresh every morning. So from this point, looking forward, life can, life can be different. You can actually go back on that upward trajectory, for want of a a better word. You can choose. You can make that decision that that I am going to recommit my life. I am going to purposely turn 
perhaps, and adjust my course. There are things that the Holy Spirit might be revealing in your heart. You you have sense of, of guilt and you know areas that need to be addressed. But you can bring those to God. His, his mercies begin afresh each morning. Today can be a new start. And God will hear you if that's your plea. God can have a, I'd like a, a fresh start. I'm sorry. I can recognize areas that I need to address. By your strength and power, help me to follow you, to walk in your light, to put you first, to live in your truth, and to bring you glory, and to love you more as I should. You'll hear that prayer. Amen. stand together and sing to close. Happy day.
face together. May the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.